afternoon. I'm Tara Sonnenshine, Executive Vice President here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I am just delighted that we are co-hosting today's event with the Inter-American Dialogue, one of many partners that we have on an ongoing series of programs on Latin America. Today is really very special for us to have the Colombian Vice President Francisco Santos Calderon with us and to have this opportunity to talk about human rights. Colombia for us has grown in importance. We now have a dedicated staff person to spearhead our efforts, Dr. Ginny Bouvier, who is really spending a great deal of time on this. She has a new book, Colombia, Building Peace in a Time of War, and it draws on many of the insights and work that we have done for many years. I'm also delighted that someplace here, if she can raise her hand, is our current senior fellow, Patricia Vasquez. She's here in the back, who's currently writing a book on oil and conflict in the Andes. <laughs> which elicited <laughs> something that sounded like a Jewish oi from our Colombian <laughs> guest. <laughs> the question is, does it include Venezuela? <laughs> um, Last fall, we hosted also a very important event here on the displacement of people in Colombia. We also looked at gender and violence. We've looked at the work of the Historical Memory Commission. We spend a lot of time on community justice mechanisms, the role of diplomacy, the role of the church, and civil society in peacemaking in Colombia. And last month, we hosted a series of roundtables for the administration and Congress with leaders of peace and human rights organizations from Colombia as part of our Citizen Dialogues for Peace project. So we are knee deep, we are committed, we are passionate about the subject at hand, and I'm absolutely delighted to let Ginny introduce and make the formal introductions for the Vice President. Would you, would you join me in welcoming all of our guests. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, before I introduce the Vice President of Colombia, I'd like to acknowledge Tara Sonnenshine, the Executive Vice President here at the Institute, for her support, her leadership, and her vision. Uh, thank you very much, Tara. We're accompanied today by Carolina Barco, Colombia's Ambassador to the United States, and her team at the Embassy. We're pleased you could join us and appreciate the opportunity you've offered for the U.S. Institute of Peace to host the Vice President. And I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Claudia Cuevas, the Human Rights Officer at the Embassy, for her collaboration in the program. I'd also like to recognize our partnering organization, the Inter-American Dialogue, whose President-elect Michael Schiffner, Schifter will serve as a discussant following Vice President Santos's remarks. We have biographical statements on each of the speakers available outside. We're joined today by representatives of the diplomatic community, including various OAS missions, Sweden, Uruguay, and Guatemala, among others, representatives from the U.S. Congress, the executive branch, the military, the private sector, academia, the media, and non-governmental and human rights organizations. So we have quite a range of human brain capacity in this room, and I hope that we can tap into it in the question and answer period. As we might note from the overwhelming turnout today, the topic of today's discussion, human rights in Colombia, is of enormous concern to the international community. It's integral to discussions about U.S. foreign policy in general, U.S. policies toward Colombia in particular, and the future of peace and stability in Colombia. The role of the international community in fostering human rights is directly related to creating a more peaceful world. From the time of the UN Declaration of Human Rights more than one half a century ago, UN member nations have sought to define international human rights standards and to establish mechanisms of accountability to those standards. At the United Nations, member governments have agreed to protect and promote human rights and to be accountable before their populations and before the world for those commitments. The UN has designed an architecture that has evolved over time to include a range of four primary mechanisms for this purpose. Treaties and conventions, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 
special rapporteurs to appoint to report independently on human rights in particular countries or to focus attention on particular human rights themes such as the situation of human rights defenders, minority issues, torture, internally displaced persons, and violence against women. The UN established the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to provide oversight and support for these efforts, and it established a Human Rights Council, which replaced the Human Rights Commission a few years ago with a mandate to protect and promote human rights. In 2006, when this council was founded, it instituted a new state-driven process, which will be reviewed in 2011, known as the Universal Periodic Review. This process engages each of the 192 member states of the UN in an assessment of the status of human rights in their countries. Under this process, states voluntarily or by lottery report to the international community on what they've done to fulfill their international obligations to protect and promote human rights and to address human rights violations when they occur. Colombia voluntarily engaged in this process in 2008 under the direction of Vice President Santos, today's speaker. We're delighted that Vice President Santos is here to discuss Colombia's experiences with the process. In addition to being the Vice President of Colombia, Vice President Santos is the coordinator for the Presidential Program on Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law, and it was in that capacity that he led the recent Universal Periodic Review process. Mr. Santos was elected Vice President on the same national ballot as Colombian President Álvaro Uribe Vélez in May 2002. He's no stranger to human rights issues. He was the founder of País Libre, which spearheaded a massive movement in Colombia in the 1990s to bring public attention to the plight of kidnapped victims in his country. Vice President Santos is well known to many of you in this room. I will merely note that in addition to being a public <coughs> official, Vice President Santos has worked as a journalist and was editor of El Tiempo, Colombia's largest daily newspaper. He received the Paul Harris Medal, Rotary International's highest award, and has spent time as a fellow at Harvard University and studied journalism and Latin American studies at the University of Kansas and the University of Texas at Austin. And we're grateful that his English is fluent enough that we don't need to provide translation services today. We're delighted to have Vice President President Santos with us today to reflect on the UPR process and to discuss the status of human rights in his native Colombia. Just a few housekeeping items before I turn the microphone over to Vice the Vice President. First, today's event is a public session. It's on the record, and we welcome the members of the media who have joined us. We look forward to a lively discussion and have structured the session to allow for a maximum of interaction with the audience. We'll open with the presentation by Vice President Santos of about half an hour, to be followed by comments by our discussant, Michael Shifter, President-elect of the Inter-American Dialogue. Vice President Santos will then respond to, to questions from the floor. Second, since this event is being webcast live, I'd ask that everyone please turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices so they won't in interfere with the sound system. And finally, I'd just like to thank the team at USIP who assisted in the logistics for this event, especially Stephanie Schwartz and Janine Sars standing over by the door, uh, as well as the staff in the Office of Public Affairs. And now, Vice President Santos, the floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, and hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Uh, let me just uh, start by, by uh, thanking uh, the Institute of Peace and the Inter-American Dialogue for, for uh, helping us uh, further the discussion regarding human rights, not with the anxiety of the free trade uh, or of specific issues, but something that looks more into a systemic view of how human rights and how a government can work in terms of creating a system of, of protecting, guaranteeing human rights. Uh, I think um, the partisanship that sometimes exists hasn't allowed to see the full picture, and, and I have no doubt that, that uh, in some years an academic study of what has happened in the last seven years is going to show uh, a more positive attitude that what, how, what the situation was seven years ago, what's going to be left afterwards, and how a system uh, regarding these issues was developed. Um, it's been a, a process of learning, a process of confrontation and dialogue. It's been a process uh, that hasn't been uh, easy, especially in a government that is very tough against crime, a government that has, uh, was elected to recover 
uh, uh, security in Colombia. But I think uh, that uh, that that systemic view is going to be overall, uh, uh, and in some time, uh, seen more positively than it's seen now. And one of the most critical elements, and I would say a central element in terms of of uh, uh, recouping all those uh, experiences and, and leaving something for, uh, for the future is, is obviously the UPR. And this is why, why, why we think uh, uh, this is such a, a critical element in the juncture of, of where Colombia is moving in terms of, of human rights, how it can be measured in the near future, and, and how it was built, what its successes are, and what its challenges uh, are in the near future. Uh, let me start by, by giving you a little bit of context. Uh, I went to many, many sessions of the uh, former Commission of Human Rights in, in Geneva. And uh, it was a very, very frustrating, to be, to say the least, uh, a scenario. It was selective. Uh, well, some countries had a huge spotlight. Many others had none at all, uh, even though you knew that horrendous things were happening in, 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 in those countries. Uh, the ideological fights and the, and, and the alliances between groups uh, to protect each other, et cetera, was, was, was the, the main focus of the, of the debate in, in most of those sessions. Uh, it was permanently just name and shame, uh, and it was, you know, here and there. Uh, and, and, and you saw that, that the real issues of human rights uh, were in the backseat of, of, of a political, ideological uh, confrontation. So when the process of changing from the commission uh, to the council, of changing the system started, we worked very hard uh, so we could uh, achieve a system that had certain conditions. One, universality. We thought that it was very important to get that issue on the table. Second, that it would become part of interactive dialogue, a dialogue that, that, and, and that, that would produce some results that would be uh, and would generate some type of cooperation that in the end uh, it would have uh, elements of cooperation, uh, that it was accountable and that there was a certain reason of a, a, a certain equality to it. Uh, we worked very hard for a year with many of partners, the Europeans, the Americans, uh, the Latin Americans, uh, some African countries, some Asian countries, and we think that in the end, uh, the, 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 full, the, the system, uh, in our perspective, had many, obviously not 100% of those issues that we tried to, to push forward in terms of the creation of the new system. So, so, so we were satisfied with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, what came out, obviously, uh, it can be greatly improved, but as a country that has commitment to human rights and accountability uh, towards it, uh, we decided that Colombia would uh, present itself, itself voluntarily to the UPR in the first uh, batch of, of countries that, that were going to be uh, reviewed. Only two countries did it in the whole world regarding uh, uh, the UPR, Colombia and Switzerland. And, um, and, 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 and to be very sincere, it has been a very, very positive, even though difficult experience. Uh, the first thing when we presented ourselves voluntarily was, you know, what type of report are we going to do? You know, you can write the report as a government and forget about it, and we decided we wanted a more interactive process. We took some choices that made the job more difficult, but I think more enriching. The first thing is that it wasn't going to be just a government document. It was going to be more of a state uh, involved all the agencies. It, therefore, we created a steering committee of nine persons, three from the, the vice presidency, three from the foreign ministry, three uh, from the Ministry of Interior and Justice to work with, with uh, in the elaboration of this report. The second choice we did was we wanted to make it uh, a, a report that had participation of civil society. Uh, we uh, invited around more than 130 NGOs to participate. Uh, the only block of NGOs that did not participate was the hardcore NGOs of human rights, and they said, you know, this is a government report, we want to participate, we don't want to, uh, and they uh, auto-excluded themselves, and obviously that's, that's their right, but more than 110 uh, organizations from civil society participated. Uh, some uh, uh, were NGOs, women NGOs, uh, Afro-Colombian NGOs, uh, uh, human rights NGOs uh, in the regions, uh, many, a, a very diverse type of, uh, of organizations, uh, so there was a, a very important participation of, of civil society in, 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 uh, in, in the process of the elaboration of the, um, of the report. The other element is that we got involved 31 state agencies, not only from the executive branch, but from the legislative and especially from the judicial branch. Uh, we sent uh, questionnaires to the, the persons in charge of human rights in the 1,100 municipalities of Colombia. Obviously, <coughs> uh, many of them didn't respond, but 
We did an effort to get as much information from the regions as possible. Um, we, um, we worked with the human rights authorities. So we had a very frank and open uh, uh, discussions with uh, the Office of the High Commissioner in Colombia uh, uh, regarding other recommendations before, et cetera. Uh, we had discussions with, uh, with what is called the G24. It's a group of 24 countries in Colombia uh, that uh, were most of the European countries, most of the Latin American countries are there, the US, Canada, uh, and with their specialists in human rights to, to, to also have feedback and, and, and uh, have more, um, make the document uh, more beefy, let's put it that way. Uh, and we opened a web, uh, a web, the web page with, with questions and with, uh, uh, with uh, possibilities of answering and, and, and opening the door for, for the general public to, 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 uh, to respond to it. And more than, we received more than 100 uh, uh, um, views and, and documents that, that were part of, 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 of the whole process. With this report in, in December of 2008, uh, we presented it into uh, the Human Rights Council. I, I personally did it, even though the methodology required it. It's, it's a, like a six-month process. Uh, and, and this report had three main uh, elements. One was the methodology. We spoke about how we built it. We thought it was something that other countries could learn uh, about it and, and improve it. And, and it was a methodology that was worth uh, discussing and putting it uh, uh, up front. Second, the context of our judicial and our our constitutional laws, uh, so they could understand understand what type of judicial framework we had. And the third element was all the, the good things, and the mediocre and the bad things in terms of human rights. And in that sense, uh, 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 the content, the content regarding uh, human rights had uh, um, five basic issues. The first one was the fight against violence. Uh, what was being done in terms of reducing violence that is, uh, and, and, and combating the different groups that were the, the, uh, some of the main violators of, of human rights. The second element was uh, uh, three of the most uh, difficult but, but also the hardcore topics regarding human rights, uh, uh, extrajudicial killings, <coughs> uh, torture, and uh, forced disappearance. Those three elements and what the situation was, what we were doing, etc. cetera. Uh, third was the fight against impunity and access to justice. What, uh, what, what was the situation and, and, and how, uh, uh, what was needed to, to improve the situation in that sense? Uh, fourth, discrimination and, uh, and protection of vulnerable populations. And, uh, and by vulnerable populations were indigenous, uh, Afro-Colombians, displaced, women, kids, uh, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transsexuals, um, prisoners, people who have been incarcerated, and obviously a very important part of, of vulnerable populations was uh, trade union leaders, uh, human rights defenders, journalists, uh, 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 social activists. And the last uh, element was uh, 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 the economic, uh, social, and cultural uh, uh, rights. So that was the component of the, of the presentation we did in, uh, in, in Geneva. Uh, in the discussion, in the discussion with, with all the sectors, civil society, state sectors. Uh, the document had uh, 69 recommendations that we voluntarily imposed ourselves with, with, uh, with uh, measurements and with goals that we wanted to achieve. Uh, and during the discussion, we had uh, 65 recommendations that, that, uh, that were uh, put forward by the countries uh, that we accepted, eight that we didn't. Uh, some of them were repeated regarding uh, 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 issues uh, like um, um, a program that the Army has called, uh, where, where they go to schools and show what the Army is, or, 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 or they do mili uh, civic uh, military uh, uh, helping kids, etc. things like that. But 65 were, were accepted, and, 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 and uh, we compiled those 69s that we had voluntarily put forward with the other, and we generated a new package of, uh, of, of goals that we set, that we set up. Uh, and we created a permanent working group to, within the government, follow up those recommendations. And, and, uh, and the five main uh, elements of, of, of the recommendations were, were repackaged in, in, in five different groups. One, international cooperation and accountability. 
Uh, second, the National Action Plan regarding human rights and international uh, uh, humanitarian law. Uh, third, uh, civil and political rights. The fourth one was impunity and access to justice. And the fifth one was vulnerable, vulnerable populations and, uh, and, and, and the pr protection of their rights. Um, with, with this, uh, with, uh, within the presentation of the OPR, the co government of Colombia took a unilateral decision of, of uh, doing uh, reports of advancement every six months. Uh, we, have, we have already, uh, this is uh, uh, the report I'm giving today. It's part of the second report that, that we put forward in December. Uh, we put a, a yearly bulletin of advances. It's all on the web page, so you can see how we're doing, what's, you know, what's working, what's not working, what, uh, where, are we, where are we in terms of, of compliance with those recommendations. Uh, so it's a very transparent process that we think it's, it's very important, especially because it goes after some of the most difficult issues and, 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 and it shows a route uh, uh, for, for working and improving many of them. Um, this team, this permanent working group, uh, uh, right now it's in the middle of of, of, uh, of uh, putting together a workshop with all the, the, the persons in the different ministries and in the different is state institutions uh, so that the compliance with, uh, with uh, the recommendations and with, uh, with what we uh, put forward in the presentation of the, OPR, of the UPR gets better. It's still a learning process. It's still, uh, uh, in some issues, we're better than in others. Uh, but we think that uh, overall it has been a process that, um, that it has generated conscience within the state. It has uh, created um, mm, a reflection. We've, we've done many, many, many uh, seminars uh, regarding you know, what is our role in terms of guaranteeing rights at, at each, of each of the institutions. Uh, there's a bigger awareness of this compromise and how important this is uh, in terms of public opinion, in terms of uh, the international community, in terms of how the difficulties affect uh, uh, other issues regarding the functioning of, uh, of the Colombian state. Uh, for the first time, we have uh, an, inst uh, an interinstitutional coordination committee that, that is working. So, 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 so it has been overall a very, very, very positive process. Uh, what results? Uh, do we have so far? Uh, um, and let me just give you some, some of them. They're all in, a, in the web page of the, of the Human Rights Program, uh, derechoshumano.gov.co uh, um, or vicepresidencia.gov.co. Uh, there's a link called EPU, Examen Periódico Universal, and you get all the information that's needed there. But let me give you some advances that I think are quite relevant. Um, for example, in, in this year regarding uh, cooperation, accountability with, with, with uh, international organisms and accountability. We had the visit of four rapporteurs, the rapporteurs for indigenous, the rapporteurs for, judi for judicial uh, impartiality, the rapporteurs for defenders of, uh, uh, of human rights, and the rapporteurs for extrajudicial killings. So, so we, we, we beat the bullet. We, we, we didn't close the doors. We opened the doors to, to the toughest of the toughest uh, 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 rapporteurs, and, and it just shows the disposition uh, of, of, uh, of having this accountability and the, this, open, this open process. We had a visit by the norm, normas, the Comisión de Normas of the ILO so, uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, rights of workers. Um, we presented last uh, November our, our report uh, in, the, in the Comité, in the Committee Against Torture. Um, we presented our report uh, regarding uh, Resolution 1612 of the of the Council of uh, uh, the Security Council regarding uh, child recruitment, um, we pre we uh, we had the revision conference of the Ottawa Convention in Cartagena, in which uh, we also presented our, our own test. We we created a a two year program with UNHCR regarding uh, uh, displacement, um, and we have three mechanisms of dialogue in place. Uh, two mechanisms in a memorandum of, 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 uh, of understanding. One of them with the European Union, in which very frank discussions with, with the European Union are, 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 are put forward. Uh, in 2009, we had three sessions in which we discussed all the topics uh, relevant to human rights. We have a mechanism of dialogue with Canada. <coughs> we had one session in July, 
and we have a memorandum of, of understanding with Spain regarding cooperation of, of human rights. Um, other results in terms of, um, of, uh, of some of the issues that were put forward, I think well, one of the most important have to do with, with the mechanisms to eradicate and eliminate uh, extrajudicial killings. And, and in 2009, we put forward for the first time the um, uh, Manual de Derecho Operacional. I don't know how to translate that. <laughs> um, we had a, a directive uh, regarding rules of engagement. For the first time, there's a very clear uh, disposition regarding rules of engagement. Uh, we have the, the, the permanent directive from the Joint Chief of Staff regarding 15 very clear measurement with, with, uh, uh, measures with uh, goals, uh, and we have the, the Office of the Human Rights Commission is following those 15 rules so that in, from training all the way to the use of intelligence, uh, 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 you have very strict controls. Um, uh, we have another directive from the armed forces, uh, uh, the 040, uh, regarding the inspection uh, function of, uh, of investigations regarding violations of human rights and how it's going to be independent from the chain of command, etc. cetera. Um, regarding forced disappearances, uh, we eradicated in Stalin Congress the, 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 the convention against the forced disappearances, even though a lot of it has already been included by different laws that Colombia has approved. Uh, we created a, we put forward and it was approved a, a social policy document with money, et cetera, regarding the mechanisms of, uh, of uh, finding and I identifying uh, persons who are disappeared, which is one of the big problems that we have. We're finding many corpses uh, especially uh, in uh, 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 regarding cases by the paramilitaries or by the guerrilla, and it has been very, very difficult to identify. So we have now a, 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 a program with, with budget, et cetera, to, to strengthen state institutions uh, to do that. Um, uh, regarding something that is very, very, very important, uh, which is uh, uh, the DAS, uh, issue the uh, Departamento Administrativo de Seguridad. Uh, there's right now a very, uh, there's a review of uh, all their intelligence uh, archives. As a matter of fact, next week a group of members of the government and, the, the, and of the Procurador are going to go to Germany to the Czech, Czech Republic and to Letonia to look at how they did in terms of cleaning uh, the archives, uh, the, the intelligence archives. Um, we have established uh, various, uh, uh, there was a, for the first time, Colombia has a lot to regulate intelligence, very clear do's and don'ts, very clear uh, accountability, and very clear uh, um, checks and balances of the use of intelligence uh, uh, within Congress. Um, there's a decree that regulated those, the use of intelligence in, 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 in judicial process, et cetera. Um, so there's big advancement in, in, in many, in many of, of, of the issues. Um, regarding displaced uh, uh, people, there's uh, new directives uh, in, in for, for example, uh, uh, kids, giving them priority access to health, to education. Um, Regarding uh, uh, human rights defenders or, 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 or members of unions, uh, there's a law of 2009 that uh, raises uh, the terms for prescription and the penalization of, of, uh, of uh, the law to anybody who kills a member of a, of, of, of a union to 30 years. Uh, there has been um, a new uh, memorandums and directives sent to governors, to mayors regarding uh, interlocution with human rights defenders, uh, with social uh, activists, uh, within the uh, uh, the chief of, of, of the army sent a circular, which is a, a directive uh, about how to deal uh, in terms of respect and protection with uh, human rights defenders, social activists. So, so it's 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 something that. Uh, even though the norm is there, there's still something that has to be done regarding applicability, accountability, and results. But, but we have the, the, the legal framework that, that, that will help us improve uh, uh, the situation. 
Um, regarding a, 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 in, and more in, in terms of results, not only norms, but in results, well, uh, in terms of violence, uh, even though in some cities it has risen, the result of this year regarding last year was uh, another decrease in, in, uh, in the number of, of murders. Uh, a dramatic increase in the number of kidnappings. Uh, um, in terms of massacres and, and victims of massacres, uh, uh, there was sort of uh, the same. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, last year we had uh, many massacres done by the FARC, which, which increased the number, especially to indigenous population. In terms of displacement, even though there's, uh, there's a disparity in numbers, we, uh, for the first time uh, or, or in a couple of years, saw a, a decrease. Uh, the combat against the, the, the new criminal gangs, which is something that is very important for the government, which is uh, uh, following very, very closely how those organizations are transforming itself, uh, what type of threats they become, uh, uh, has produced uh, more, uh, more of them being, more of their leaders being captured, more of their members being captured, so, uh, but, but there's still a transformation. The ability of drug trafficking uh, um, creating the conditions for recruitment uh, to those groups uh, uh, is still something that is very worrisome. Regarding uh, extrajudicial killings, uh, CNEP, one of the most uh, uh, independent uh, 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 it's not an NGO. ¿Cómo que será CNEP? Ah? Sí, it's an NGO. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, they, 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 they did a report regarding extrajudicial killings and showed that there was almost a total elimination, a, a decrease from around 106 cases to two cases uh, in a report of 2009. Two is too many, but, but I think the, the, all, the, all the, the, the work we had done and all the decisions we took regarding that uh, have produced the results. Uh, there's, so far, there have been 130 members of the military condemned in jail. There's 300 of them who are still who are being tried. There's 800 more who have who are now at, uh, under investigation. Uh, unfortunately, there has been some uh, some problems with the attorney general's office, but we think they they will be solved. Uh, uh, the chief of human rights in the arm in the in the army is a general. When we got there seven years ago, it was a, a captain. So at least so. So you're getting more and more and more and more conscious regarding the importance of, of, of this issue. Uh, all the elements of, um, of rewards and, and reserve, the, uh, the use of reserve funds are now controlled by the, um, by the Contraloria General. I have, I have some, thank you. Um, for the first time, Army units have uh, operational, uh, operational uh, uh, advisors uh, with uh, with uh, law, you know, with understanding of the law and limits of, of the use of force. We have 60 of them. Uh, uh, right now, there's 100 of them. 60 of them were were uh, were activated this year. 45 more are being activated. Um, so you know, there's uh, there's a lot of results. That, that, that can be shown in, in, and can be followed up in terms of, of what the UPR is putting in terms of, uh, of uh, or it's looking or, or, or setting goals. And, and in that sense, um, this has put us on our toes to, to understand uh, that, uh, that uh, you have to, you know, to move forward, even though in some, in some elements or in some sectors it's not as aggressive or it's not the results, or the results are not as, as as, um, as, uh, as as aggressive as as as, as in others, uh, peace and justice. For example, we have more than uh, uh, twelve hundred uh, free versions have been finished. There's fourteen thousand crimes related to sixteen thousand uh, victims that um, have been totally established. Who who did it? 18,000 more uh, with 30, 31,000 victims uh, are in the process of being, um, of being cleared. Um, 2,700, and here's something that is very important, 2,778 dead bodies have been exhumed. 700 of them have been returned to their families. Uh, regarding reparations, uh, this uh, 2009 
with admin administrative reparation, the government uh, 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 paid around $100 million to 26,000 victims. Um, next year is going to be $150 million. The National Commission for Reparation and Reconciliation it has produced, uh, the, the, in, in terms of uh, memory and history, historic memory, uh, two reports <laughs> regarding El Trujillo and um, Trujillo and El Salado with the vulnerable population like indigenous and Afro-Colombians, uh, all the mechanisms for concertation, for special protection, for differentiated action are, are moving forward. Uh, there's a, a document uh, uh, that the Intersectoral Commission for the, the uh, fight against discrimination uh, against the Afro-Colombian population put forward some very, very <laughs> radical uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, there's a, a law now that's going to come forward to Congress to start moving forward in terms of, of uh, very aggressive affirmative action policies. And, um, and also there's a, a national uh, social policy document that is going to, to put uh, some money into very important amount of money in terms of, of special actions uh, to work uh, attending the recommendation of this commission. Um, there's a lot of work, and I don't want to, to keep just a, a, a because I, I rather have an, an interactive dialogue, but it has been, I would say, a, a very a fruitful, a very, very fruitful uh, exercise. Uh, we're obviously, we're still not there. There are many problems, and we understand there are, there are resistance, and, uh, uh, but I think when you look uh, in these two years what has happened, you, you can see a state working more closely in the same direction, being more accountable, having more interactive dialogue, opening doors, and measuring itself, and I think uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the UPR, as I said in the beginning, which was part of a process that started in 2002, uh, is, a, is a crucial element that has helped us um, get the house more in order, show more results, uh, and have you know, goals that we have to pursue. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, we will leave that uh, totally institutionalized uh, for the next government. It's a, it's a state compromise. It's not a, a, a government of President Uribe's compromise. It's, it's, it's a government of Colombia. So, so uh, we hope that, um, that we will keep following up those recommendations and, and be very transparent regarding where we are improving and where we are not. And I think that's a very good guideline that we have how to impose and impose ourselves in a manner of, uh, in, in, in the manner that human rights should start working with states that, uh, that want to uh, uh, insert themselves in the international community, be accountable like Colombia is and is a manner of, uh, as I said before, interactive dialogue, cooperation, and measuring the results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President, for debates and discussions in Washington. Thank you, Michael, for your willingness to provide some insights on this topic of today's discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ginny, and thank you. Uh, my very nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure, first of all, for me to be here, and uh, on behalf of the Inter-American Dialogue, we're delighted to uh, co-sponsor this event with the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, it's a particular pleasure to be here, an honor to be here with Vice President Santos, a uh, good friend for a number of years. I'm very impressed that uh, since he arrived in Washington, his effect was immediate since President Obama mentioned Colombia favorably last night in the State of the <laughs> Union um, uh, speech, and I, the only conclusion I could reach was that uh, President's, uh, Vice President Santos had already arrived <laughs> and had shown that he's very influential, so it's amazing uh, how he operates. I see a lot of people, a lot of good friends uh, here who uh, are on the edge of their seats dying to uh, ask uh, Vice President Santos some questions uh, and have a good exchange, so I'm going to be very brief and just say a few comments and reflections on the very interesting uh, remarks made by the Vice President. Um, the first is that um, the UPR, I think, is an interesting, innovative uh, uh, instrument that emphasizes an approach towards dealing with human rights questions that is much more uh, 
cooperative, non-confrontational, let's say, than other approaches. Uh, it has a number of advantages. I think the main one is that it does provide, as Vice President Santos said, uh, a global framework. Um, the Colombia has the debate about human rights in Colombia often has the problem uh, that people tend to focus on different violations. And sometimes people talk past each other because people point to different things. Uh, this provides at least a common framework that everybody can uh, operate from. And the second thing is that in Colombia, there are often debates about the many Colombias that exist. Things get better in some place and get worse in other places. This gives a national uh, sort of global framework. So that, it seems to me that that's a very uh, useful, valuable uh, mechanism. I also think, just to underscore something the Vice President said about Colombia, its openness to uh, the, the rapporteurs, as he mentioned, the Organization of American States, Inter-American Human Rights Commission, the court, uh, whatever one thinks about the situation in Colombia, um, I think there's little question that the government has been open and receptive, which I think deserves a lot of credit uh, for that. The, this whole exercise, I think, raises a broader question, which I'll just, I'll just pose the question, not answer, but uh, about human rights work and shedding light on human rights situation in a country like Colombia, which is extremely complicated, extremely challenging. Um, and um, does one go about it in a way that just um, tries to be more political in a sense? In other words, to try to, uh, ha how does one reduce the number of violations in the country, which I think everybody wants to do? Is it a more of a confrontational approach? Is it more of a cooperative approach? What works? Uh, and here I think we at least have, an, we can at least sort of examine uh, another exercise, another experiment. And I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but it seems to me that that should be part of the debate of what is most effective in achieving the goal that we all want to achieve, which is to have a better human rights situation uh, in Colombia, which I think everybody wants. Um, the second point is that um, the sense here, I, I think, in most of the reporting that's done, including by a lot of people uh, in this room, uh, is that while things have did improve considerably uh, after 2002 on issues like uh, uh, kidnapping and homicides and other dimensions, that in the last couple of years, the last year, year or two, there's the sense that at least these gains have not been completely consolidated and that there is uh, uh, there are a number of indications that the security situation uh, in Colombia remains difficult despite um, the advances that were made um, in uh, five or six years ago. So that I think is uh, I think something that we should uh, be concerned about. Uh, you take the, the city like Medellin, for example, uh, which had made remarkable, uh, very impressive progress uh, and today seems to uh, be going back, if one looks at some of the, the, the figures, uh, again, becoming very problematic and very troubling in terms of the security situation and obviously the human rights situation. So um, I think in terms of tr the tracking the trend, there have been some uh, clearly some gains that deserve to be recognized, but also um, some signs of perhaps backsliding that also deserve a lot of uh, close attention. A lot of these, these violations, this is not a matter of state policy in Colombia. Uh, this is, this is uh, primarily um, violations committed by illegal groups. And this is my third point, third and final point, uh, which is that a lot of the illegal armed groups, uh, mafias and the FARC uh, primarily, are uh, obviously financed by uh, the drug trade, um, they buy arms, um, there's money, a lot of money, uh, criminal activity, illicit activity, and this raises the whole question which President, Vice President Santos did not mention, but it's an issue that he's talked about a lot, and I'm going to mention it because I think it's appropriate in this conversation, which is core responsibility. Um, there is an international dimension of this problem um, to the extent that Colombia is trying to address the human rights situation. Um, it doesn't help if there isn't any effective cooperation uh, internationally uh, to try to control um, the sale and flow of arms, uh, money, and uh, the drug 
uh, question as well. Uh, now Mexico, the situation in Mexico, I think, has created more awareness about this in the United States, uh, and there are some initial steps that are being taken. But uh, I just want to say that I think it's very, very important to include this aspect in this discussion as well, uh, because I think it's the logical conclusion of what do you do to help uh, Colombia and other, and other countries that are going through this very difficult period, um, this question of co-responsibility. So I'll leave it there. I just want to congratulate, commend uh, Vice President, uh, Government of Colombia, and thank Ginny again for this invitation. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of interesting questions for the Vice President. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me just say a word about format for the Q&A period. Uh, we have not only a packed room here, but we have a packed overflow room down the hall. And they are seeing us, I assume, magically through the television um, outlets. But if they have questions, they're being handed index cards and we'll be funneling them in here. If, they're, if, they'd like, if any of them would like to come and stand in line, they're also welcome to join us in the main room. We have two microphones on either side of the room. I would ask folks to, who have questions to please line up on either side and we'll, we'll alternate between the two sides. Uh, I'd like you to please identify who you are and if you represent an organization to let us know what organization. Um, and while you're all getting situated, I'll take the moderator's prerogative and just open up with a couple of questions uh, for Vice President Santos. The, f the first question I have is how uh, you see this new UPR process in relation to the other existing international human rights mechanisms. Do you see it as a complementary kind of process that can enable you to engage better in other, um, other human rights processes, or do you see it as a potential substitute for previous processes? Uh, and the second question has to do with follow-up. Um, what happens once you've reported to the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Is there any mechanism then for civil society? You've, you've consulted civil society all the way along in producing this report. Is there a presentation to civil society and an opportunity for civil society to then engage in discussion about how the recommendations might be implemented on the ground? Um, so I'll just start with those two questions. It looks like we have uh, quite a lineup and maybe I'll, I'll moderate and direct the questions from a seated position and give Vice President Santos the podium. If he, unless he prefers to sit. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you know, the UPR, uh, I think it's in that after seeing how the system worked before, I think it's a good advancement for those countries that, uh, that really want to cooperate with the system. The countries that don't, whatever system you put forward is not going to work. And, and there's some examples regarding the UPR. In, in some cases, some countries, uh, 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 you know, the first 45 uh, or 50 countries that uh, sign up for questions and for recommendations are the ones who speak during the process. And in some cases, those, the, those countries were able to, to feed, uh, to feed uh, uh, the lot with countries that were favorable to them. And, and so it was a session in which uh, Everybody spoke wonderful things <laughs> regarding the country that was being reviewed. Uh, those type of cases, uh, whatever system you want to put forward, that's con not going to work. For a country that's accountable and that, and that, and that thinks that, uh, that this type of engagement uh, uh, is important, this system has provided a mechanism that, that helped us in terms of uh, uh, creating accountability, uh, designing uh, advancements and, and, uh, and follow up. You know, what, one of the things that we uh, that we uh, that no country so far has done it like Colombia has is the, is the whole follow up process, uh, and 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 this the, you know this speech here and other and other that we have given in Colombia and in Geneva speaking of all our follow up process shows that for us at least for Colombia we take this very seriously and we think this is a type of engagement that that works for for us, uh, and that works for human rights. Uh, in terms of, 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 of measuring advancements, uh, showing problems, and, and creating solutions. Uh, but the process is more inclusive. Uh, the, the, the report that the government puts forward during the UPR comes together with two reports that, uh, that, that, that the Human Rights, uh, uh, the, of the High Commissioner of Human Rights puts together. One, regarding 
uh, other recommendations that the system has put forward uh, uh, for that country, and another one that they built with civil society and NGOs uh, uh, um, uh, in a visit in a visit to the country. So, so, so this UPR in terms of the government, it's complementary to the rest of the system. Uh, what's going to happen now that in 2011 there's going to be a, a reform of the system? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, 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 more countries than, than, than before uh, are seeing this in the way that Colombia sees it as, as something positive, but, uh, but some other countries that have the ability to, to manage the system and to, and to manipulate it they are going to try to put a fight in terms of restricting the, the ability of having criticism and having frank, constructive but frank discussions regarding human rights. And, and civil society, uh, uh, we are having discussions uh, with, uh, with uh, the G24 countries in how can we get involved civil societies in the follow-up process. Those who were engaged during the, during, during the build-up and, and how to get them involved. So, so, so I think that's going to be a step that we're going to take forward the, this, this year. Thank you very much. Let's start on the left side with Mark and then we'll go over to you. And then I have some questions that have begun to come in from the other room. So. It just depends where you are, whether I'm on the left side or the right side. <laughs> That's true. Um, first, let me thank the Vice President. Um, and I think that everyone clearly agrees that the kind of uh, process that you're talking about uh, does seem to be a step forward. I would note two things. One is previously under the Civil and Political Rights Convention, countries did have the opportunity to present in an obligation, I believe uh, over every couple of years, their own assessment of their performance with respect to compliance uh, with that, that would have also been an opportunity to do something of a similar nature. The other is whether the permanent working group that you mentioned, which is following up, whether they include at the moment civil society representatives, and if not, whether there's an opportunity for them to be, in a sense, to the community to select their choices for those uh, individuals who might participate in that. My question, though, goes to, as you know, the crisis, oh, by the way, Mark Schneider International Crisis Group. Um, we put, put out a report last year, which is outside now, which, which points to the question of one of, the, one of our concerns about the conflict not coming to an end is that, in our view, the lack of sufficient progress with respect, with, in terms of respect for human rights um, undermined to some degree the government's ability to uh, bring that conflict to an end. And here I would just, uh, it's sort of a reflection. Why has it taken seven years for these kinds of actions to be taken by the government with respect to many of the issues that you raised, extrajudicial killings, forced disappearances, going after the issue of impunity. Um, and I just would note that these are not old, th these are not issues solely from the past. You mentioned your report to the um, Commission, the UN Commission on Torture. Uh, last November, they issued their report, I think um, around the 20th, which they criticized the Colombian executive branch for actions which threaten judicial independence. Uh, the uh, end of October, you mentioned, uh, and I think it's correct, it's very positive that Colombia has cooperated with the work of the special rapporteurs. This was Philip Alston, special rapporteur on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary uh, executions. And he concluded, and I want to start this way, that he said, I found no evidence indicating that the killings were carried out um, had been directed, no evidence indicating the killings had been directed from the top. This is extrajudicial killings. But he went on to say, the sheer number, their geographic spread, and the diversity of military units implicated indicate that these killings were carried out in a more or less systematic fashion by significant elements within the military. So the question is why it took seven years when it was viewed, has been viewed as systematic, for the government to take appropriate actions to bring that kind of systematic violations to an end. Thank you, Mark. Can I answer? Okay. Um, uh, let, me, let me start by saying that I disagree totally with your premise that, uh, that, that, that human rights issues uh, undermine the possibility of eliminating the conflict. I think what's eliminating, the, what's, what's not allowing uh, the conflict to be uh, eradicated or eliminated is, is uh, drug trafficking that fuels uh, the possibility of, of those illegal groups to survive on the one hand. And I think on the other hand, uh, the extra breathing room that the FARC has gotten due to its 
ability to to have a, a extra territorial uh, uh, areas under which they can uh, they can they, they can get some breathing air, right. and and I think the third element is that they still, uh, you know, when you look at what seven years is nothing for a gorilla that has been there for forty years, uh, and that only seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, had forty two thousand square kilometers of free territory where they were doing. I think they, they saw only seven years ago that power was right next, you know, was, was, uh, was around the corner. I think they still don't understand that, uh, that, um, that, that this is it, that, that it's better to negotiate a, a peace process, and the government has understands very clearly that the end of it has to do uh, with negotiations than to keep, uh, obviously, not the negotiations they thought they were going to have in the year 2000, 2002, 2001 very different ones, uh, but I think it's, it, it's, it's a combination of those elements and not human rights. Uh, why seven years? No, we've been working since the beginning. Uh, we have actions regarding extrajudicial killings in 2006, and in 2007 uh, and in 2008, when we start finding the problem to grow, that's when we decide, uh, the government decides to, to create the commission, a commission to look into the problem with the military. It finds out to be a very great problem. Uh, and starts taking most more radical steps. But if you look from 2005, 2006, and 2007, the Human Rights Program with the Attorney General's Office, uh, with uh, the Chief of Staff Command, has certain directives and has uh, was moving in terms of, of locating where the problem is, getting the judicial system to work. Many of those 300 persons who were convicted are convicted of cases between 2005 and 2007. Uh, uh, the dimensions of it was seen clearly only in 2007, and that's when the decisions were taken. 2000, yeah, 2007, 2008, 2008, and that's when those, you know, the more uh, aggressive decisions were taken, and that's what has permitted it to stop. So, so it's not something that that that, that we were uh, uh, not looking into, say, uh, and only only saw it uh, in in in. In, in the latest uh, in the latest years, impunity. There's a uh, 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 the the government promoted a, a, a national social policy, a compass regarding the fight against impunity, that put uh, 30 million dollars of Colombian or 25 million dollars of Colombian money of Colombian of budget for the fight against impunity in human rights cases, and, and that's th that's a program that has that we've been working. Since the year 2004, it was approved in 2005, and the money is being spent because it's a five-year program uh, to get better results in terms of, of access and, uh, and fight against impunity regarding human rights cases. So, so even though you might see only those results here in the UPR, there are many instances in which those uh, issues were being worked from 2002, from 2003, 2004. Uh, 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 we found a problem uh, that needed to be tackled immediately. We did. Others are policies that just take time to, to get developed. Okay. We have quite a lineup of questions here. I'll let you, why don't you go uh, for the next you. one, and then I think we'll, we'll try to Well, we go. I'm India Globe in Asia today. You have given a very good analysis of the human rights problem in Colombia. My question is two-part question. One. Have you given this report, what you have given to the UN, to the United States State Department, because they also issue yearly report on human rights and uh, not very good Colombia's record last year. And second, Al-Qaeda and uh, terrorists are looking at Colombia as far as drugs and uh, making money, and U.S. is worried about also how big problem is you think Al-Qaeda and, and uh, terrorism in your country they make cross the border in the United States. We, we, we work very closely uh, uh, with the U.S. State Department. Most of this information, they, they have it. This exact presentation, we haven't, and, and I think we, we, uh, one of the things that we're learning uh, how to show many of the things we do regarding human rights, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the fight uh, has been so, uh, so looking at the, at, the, at the trees and not at the forest and, uh, that, uh, that we haven't been able to show a system that is being put into place that has worked, that is working better, that obviously needs improvement, and I think that's something that needs to be done more aggressively. Uh, regarding Al-Qaeda, um, uh, we have 
very little evidence, but some evidence of uh, uh, radical Islamic elements in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's, you know, smoking gun, but there's a little bit of evidence of, uh, of, uh, uh, radical, of, of some radical elements radicalizing some, uh, some and creating uh, uh, madrasas and, and things that we didn't have in, in Colombia. In, in some areas of Colombia, we, we didn't have them. Uh, we, uh, it's something that obviously worries us. Uh, but, uh, but so far, the evidence of, of what they're up to, we don't have very clear uh, information regarding, regarding uh, presence of Al-Qaeda in Colombia or, or, or work by Al-Qaeda in Colombia. We don't, we don't have any evidence, clear evidence about that. Okay, a couple of questions from the Annex. Uh, Kelly Nichols, Director of the U.S. Office on Colombia, has two questions. First, we've been very concerned by the continued impunity for cases of alleged extrajudicial executions and cases against human rights defenders, especially recently due to the fact that many soldiers alle allegedly involved in the Sawacha case have been freed. What is the government doing to address this situation? And the second is a concern about the privatization of the protection program for human rights defenders. Uh, she says, our Colombian colleagues have requested that the Minister, Ministry of Interior and Justice assume this program. This was rejected. What is the government's plan for this program? Uh, regarding the, 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 the recent uh, decisions by a judge of uh, freeing from jail, not freeing from the process, the members of the military who, who, who are being investigated for the Swacha and other extrajudicial killings. I think it has to do a little bit, it has to do more with the inefficiency of the Attorney General's office. Uh, they changed the people in charge, which I thought was a mistake, but they're an independent branch of government. Uh, what we have done is maintain those members of the military uh, constrained to bases, to the bases, uh, operational bases, uh, and we hope that, uh, that the, the government cannot do any, can, we can't do anything. The executive branch cannot do anything. It's a problem that it's in the hands of the Attorney General's office. Uh, we've given them all they, they needed. They asked for more, more, uh, more investigators. We gave them the money. They asked for more uh, uh, fiscales. We gave them the money. And it's just, a, I would say, it's a matter of time before, before, before they're able to, to fix those problems. And uh, the judge, acted according to law. As you know, uh, uh, we changed the law uh, to give more guarantees to those who are being processed. Uh, uh, so uh, before that reform, the Attorney General's office had the ability to investigate and to capture and to order somebody to be put in jail. Now that's, those are, uh, now the Attorney General's office uh, asks a judge whether a person can be captured and put in jail during prevent, preventively during the whole process, and it's a judge who decides, an independent judge, a judge, as we call it, guarantees who decides uh, uh, what happens to, to, to those persons. It's those, those, uh, no entiendo. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. They're free from jail, but they're not free from the process. They're still, the, the, the process of investigation is, is still, and, and we hope that, that the Attorney General's office will, 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 will improve uh, the inefficiencies. And the privatization of the protection program. First of all, it's not being privatized. The government's still going to pay for it. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, many of, 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 of some sectors of, uh, of civil society uh, 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 are allowed to put what they called uh, uh, trustful bodyguards, which means in some cases parents, uh, in some cases people who are not the, 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 the most efficient in terms of protection. We decided to eliminate that and, uh, and, uh, and create a, a system that is more accountable, either give it to the police or uh, to a company pay for that protection to a company, uh, a professional company uh, uh, with uh, uh, with auditing by the Colombian government that can give protection. So it's not privatization. There's discussions regarding how that, um, how that protection program is going to work. Uh, I think uh, this next week there's going to be a meeting with, with NGOs, 
uh, with uh, labor leaders to decide finally what's going to be the, the, the decision regarding the protection program. But anyway, it's not privatization. The government pays for it. We pay for the, the, the security of them. And obviously, what we need to do, if it's going to be a private company, have very good auditing process so that the protection is maintained at the levels uh, that, uh, that, um, that, uh, that, is ne that are needed. Thank you. Why don't we take a group of three questions on this side and then see how we do, time-wise. <laughs> Um, my name is Carlos Quesada. I'm the director of the Latin America program here at Global Rights, and we are a capacity building human rights organization. As you know, the UN independent expert on minority issues, Gay McDougall, is going to visit Colombia next week for two weeks in order to assess the human rights situation of Afro Colombians in Colombia. Uh, what would you say are like the major achievements um, by the Colombian government in order to improve the situation of Afro Colombians? And linked to this, there's a statement that has been said. Um, around that there is a disproportionate impact of the armed conflict within Afro Colombian communities. And if you can comment on that, okay. uh, too. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my, name is, my name is Felipe Estefan, and I'm a graduate Colombian student in public diplomacy at Syracuse University. Um, I had a question regarding technology innovation and the use of social media for the protection and promotion of human rights. Uh, last week, Secretary Hillary Clinton gave a, a policy speech on this and highlighted that link, and in her speech she mentioned Colombia. And I was just wondering, Mr. Vice President, um, whether the Colombian government is thinking of ways in which it can use social media like Facebook and Twitter and technology innovation in the form of SMS short codes crisis mapping, use of mobile platforms uh, to promote the protection of human rights in Colombia. <laughs> Give me your card. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Ian Campbell. I'm with the AGA group. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for your presentation. I think the government of Colombia has done a great service to its population by securing the cities, but unfortunately, the result of that, or inadvertent result of that, is the armed forces or armed groups went out to the remote areas where Afro-Colombians and indigenous uh, live, increased the displacement population. What is the government doing to make sure that there's a security presence, a state presence in, the, in those remote areas, which will then allow for a more um, protection to the citizens, Afro-Colombians, indigenous women, and displaced individuals to make sure that their human rights are not further violated on top of uh, the current situation that's happening now. Thank you. And let, let me tie in one relevant question from Andy Hickey of American University's Peace and Conflict Resolution Program. He asks for more information about specific government programs that are in place for education for displaced children. Okay. Um, Afro-Colombian achievements. Uh, there has been a lot of investment uh, in many of our Colombian uh, uh, communities, especially in the Pacific, but I think we're still in debt, to be very, very, very sincere. That's one of the reasons why we, uh, the government created the Intersectoral Commission uh, for the Advancement of, of Afro-Colombian of, uh, Afro Raizal uh, and Raizal populations. Uh, I headed that commission. Uh, to be very sincere, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it was it was uh, uh, quite an experience uh, to see uh, the difference of the Afro-Colombian communities by regions, to see the discrimination, the blatant racism that, uh, that, that they suffer. Uh, for the first time, I think at, at the highest level, the president, the vice president, the recognition that Colombia had, uh, that there was racism in, in Colombian society was, uh, a, 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 a was accepted. The recommendations of that commission, and we can give uh, uh, you those, the, the document, are very, very aggressive. And right now they're being, they're being put into place two, 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 two very specific things. One is an, a national social policy document, uh, so we can put goals in terms of advancement, uh, money, uh, uh, you know, uh, where we want to go and, and how we're going to get there. And the <coughs> other leg of that, uh, of, 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 of the critical recommendations is, uh, a very aggressive uh, affirmative action program 
regarding access to universities, regarding privileged uh, access to uh, uh, to social programs, uh, a focalized, uh, focalized uh, uh, um, uh, incentives to, to to many of the of the social programs that the government have directed specifically measurement of impact. So, so we hope that with those two uh, two issues that that that, that we think uh, will, will be in place by either the middle or the end of this year, uh, we will uh, we will start moving forward in terms of uh, of uh, eradicating or or, or, or uh, reducing the inequality and uh, and the social and political debt that Colombia has with with Afro Colombians, without a doubt, uh, right now one of the biggest and most problematic elements of 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 of, of, of the violence of Colombia that it has been displaced to the Pacific Coast, where basically uh, it has a, 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 a Afro Colombian a, a population. Uh, we are changing the whole disposition of how our troops are, are, are being placed, where are they going. There's a very big uh, a military operation in the northern part of Chocó. We are redistributing and rethinking the whole process of, of actions in Nariño. There's the creation of, of a unified command uh, uh, for the southern part of Colombia that has Nariño and, and uh, uh, basically it's Nariño and, and Putumayo. Uh, but our main task right now is Nariño, but uh, certainly uh, with our success in most of Colombia, the displacement of drugs and the displacement of, of that violence has had a disproportionate impact on, on Afro-Colombian population. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and, and with the security, we think uh, that, that we'll be able to, to, um, to at least solve that problem. The rest of it has to be solved by social policies, as, as, as I described. Education for the displaced. There are many programs right now. For example, uh, there's any displaced kid has immediate access to, to education wherever they land. It's an obligation by mayors uh, to open spaces to kids who are, uh, who are, uh, who are being displaced. There's special programs uh, that the ministry has in place to, uh, to um, uh, you know, when, when somebody's displaced, they lose two or three years of school very, very quickly. Uh, and so you need to you need to reduce that uh, that uh, that hole in education uh, quickly so that desertion doesn't become another part of of the problem. Uh, I would uh, if 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 she wants, I can contact her with 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 the person in charge of uh, vulnerable populations in the Ministry of Education can explain in, in in big detail how how that system and how those special programs for displaced people are are being implemented and how successful or and what problems they have. All right, why don't we take a couple questions over here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, my oh, question. Wait, wait, I forgot to, to answer one. Social media had, n you know, no tenga ni idea. But uh, I'm, I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to see what ideas you guys have. You know. So, really, si me das tu tarjeta. Es en serio. Claro. Pues si es el negocio, no importa. Pues si me sirve a mí, al gobierno, pues. Okay. Uh, my name is Daniel Brito uh, from the Office of Congressman Raul Grijalva of the uh, 7th District of Arizona. And uh, Mr. Vice President, my question pertains to rule of law and uh, justice in Colombia. Uh, according to uh, this document here, which is uh, a D Drug Enforcement Administration uh, document printed in the Federal Register in August of 2000, uh, according to this document, uh, Mr. President Uribe's Chief of Staff or uh, Secretary of Government uh, and political alter ego when he was uh, Governor of Antioquia, was the president of a company which was the single largest importer in all of Colombia of a chemical which is critical to the processing of cocaine, uh, potassium permanganate. Uh, this document was produced after three shipments totaling 50,000 kilos were seized by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. And according to the same document, uh, from 1996 to 1998, 200 metric tons of potassium permanganate were imported into Colombia uh, by GMP Chemicals, which uh, Mr. Moreno Villa was the president of. Uh, now, that, that's a very interesting finding there. Uh, it becomes rather disconcerting when you put it next to the Defense Intelligence Agency document, which the National Security Archive uh, found, which uh, listed President Uribe as Associate 82 and described him as a Colombian politician uh, with close ties to the Medellin cartel who, part who uh, cooperated with them. <coughs> now, I have raised this issue with uh, representatives of your, of your embassy, 
and received no substantive response. I actually uh, was able to put this question to President Uribe himself, and he noted that uh, Mr. Moreno died in a tragic helicopter accident, uh, as if that you know settled the matter. But uh, you know, as far as I know, the other main industrial use of this chemical is uh, processing uh, computer chips. And as far as I know, there's not a significant. Uh, okay. Well, so that's one other use. But uh, so we have. Okay. You know, so, there's. So, what, but, uh, if no, I can finish, yeah, so okay. my question is: To what legitimate end would uh, Mr. Moreno be importing these large amounts of this list to controlled chemical? Well, let me let me just. Uh, there's many. Th that question has been answered many, many times, uh, publicly and privately, not only by President Uribe, uh, uh, but uh, but by Moreno when he was alive. Uh, unfortunately. To a legitimate, I would have to die, go to heaven, and come back and be reborn to, to answer that question since, since, since he's not able to do it. But I'm just going to, uh, by, the, by the insinuations that, uh, that you put uh, together in your question, uh, just um, give you a little bit of answer. Uh, not regarding speculations of a DEA uh, intelligence No, this report. is not a speculation. This is a DEA document. Yeah, and, the importations and, and, happen. But if you, had, if you had asked your own government, you would have seen the answer by the DIA agency regarding that report. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, go to your own government and to ask it to the military intelligence, you know, what that report was, what that report means, and how they said that that was a mistaken report and how it had no, no uh, reality to it. But, but uh, don't worry, you know, uh, I hope, uh, if not, we'll help you with your government get all the information that, that is needed. Uh, uh, we have a little bit of access with your government. I, I hope you'll have better access. But uh, let me give you a couple of, there's been no more, you know, how many people have we extradited drug traffickers? Around 1,000 in these seven, six years, so seven years. Uh, we have, I think you will not find a government that has fought drug traffickers as tough and as hard and as consistently as this government. So uh, my answer to your question is uh, you should look at the facts of uh, what we have done against drug traffickers in these seven and a half years of government. Uh, you should check your sources and, and find uh, uh, how a lot of the information that you put forward in, in your question has been discredited by your own government and the same agencies uh, you put forward. And, um, and, and I think that uh, the relationship between the Colombian government and the US government regarding the fight against drugs has never had a better ally uh, uh, as and a better, a better results uh, in the past seven and a half years as the ones we have had and shown very, very clearly to the world. As a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, the results in terms of fumigation, of extradition, of uh, uh, um, property assets, uh, seizure, uh, of these seven and a half year governments have no comparison, no comparison with what former governments of Colombia or other governments of the world have done. So our results in our fight against drug trafficking uh, are very, very, very clear, and uh, and I would encourage you really to 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 ask uh, those agencies uh, that that uh, that you put forward to to send you all the information that they sent to us, and they, they have publicly that they have made public. Okay, administration. Yeah. My question was, what did Mr. Moreno do with 200 I, metric I don't, tons I don't of potassium and permanganate? I don't know, Mr. Moreno. I still Moreno. have not heard an answer. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Jim. Why don't we take the next two? Yeah. Um, my name is Jim Jones, and I have been sporadically involved in Colombia since the 1960s, uh, during the Alliance for Progress years. Um, uh, compiled, numbers are crunched, whatnot. Uh, and then some decisions are taken with regard to uh, where Colombia stands uh, with vis-a-vis uh, -vis several dimensions of human rights. However, it so happens that there are non-governmental agencies in Colombia, some of them uh, well-respected, uh, whose figures don't um, 
um, square very well with, with the public figures. In some cases, the discrepancy is, 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 is alarming. Uh, so I just, you know, my question to you would be, what, uh, whom should I trust, okay, and why? And in this same context also, you mentioned that, that uh, in this process of gathering information, okay, the UPR uh, process, that civil society institutions participate in it, okay, uh, NGOs, uh, you said several uh, participated, but there were a few that I think you refer to as hardcore human rights NGOs who didn't want to participate. I'd be curious to know what are those hardcore NGOs uh, and wh why do you think that they didn't want to participate? Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. And the next one? Well, Vice President Santos, thank you so much for coming and taking the time to speak with us publicly. My name is Annalise, and I work with Lutheran World Relief, a development and relief organization that has programs in three regions of Colombia. And we do use social media, so your answers will be on Twitter this afternoon. And I'm sure the young man can give you a lesson in how to read those. <laughs> I need one as well. Um, we work in 30 uh, different countries throughout the world, and as I said, we work in three regions of Colombia, largely with displaced communities to plant food, um, stimulate local economies, build homes, and basically generate more secure rural communities. Um, for the first time in our history of programming in Colombia, and in related to all of our programs throughout the world, every single one of our partners in Colombia is under threat. Um, last year, we had partners that were murdered, raped, received death threats, and some that were displaced for the third time. So our programs and development have turned into peer relief programs. We're not able to advance in growing food, establishing local economies, and increasing uh, access to markets and so forth as we would like. What we're seeing is that generally communities that are suffering um, these abuses are having their land taken over or they're losing it because as farmers in America and farmers in Colombia know, they're unable to pay off um, the loans and they lose their land as a result despite protections under the law that are supposed to um, provide some relief for IDPs. So my questions for you are, are there are two and they're not related to the UPR, so I hope you'll forgive me and indulge mm. me. One is, what is the government doing to help protect the land of rural farmers that are displaced, particularly in the north, in Cordoba and Sucre, where we have programs? And second of all, what do you suggest for a mid-level organization like our own that wants to work along with the government and communities to develop rural Columbia, but is unable to do so because of the human rights abuses? And I would like to say that in all cases, those are perpetrated by reorganized paramilitary groups. Um, from the reports we've received. Thank you. Okay, we have here uh, the person who was in charge, now he's ambassador at the OAS, of protecting uh, the whole uh, land protection program, which uh, from the beginning of the government, uh, we took that idea from the World Bank and we have been able to implement it. Maybe he can, he can, uh, he can, he can tell us more about how much land uh, has been protected and, and how that works. But I'll give you an example. Uh, for in Montes de Maria, uh, a lot of the, most of the land has been protected under this provision. Uh, so there can be no transaction of land. Um, and it's a committee of peasants and the local and the regional government with the president of the state government that decides which land can be sold uh, legally, so that land that has been uh, acquired through, f through a forceful uh, displacement doesn't become part of the market and doesn't become uh, uh, entangled in, in, in commercial, uh, in, commercial uh, 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 in the market. Um, it has been, a, a, I think I would say, a, a successful experience. Uh, obviously, not all the land in Colombia that has been taken over by, by legal groups from the extreme right to the extreme left uh, to the drug traffickers uh, has been able to be protected. But, uh, but I think in that sense, the, 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 the protection of, of land that Colombia has been able to do through Acción Sociale and its projects is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment that I think due to its size is the biggest now, the biggest in the world. Um, but 
one of the problems of the land in Colombia is that the whole institutionality of, of, of land titling, land protection, uh, 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 is very, very, very weak. And, and in many cases, a lot of lands have no titles. You know, people moved into those lands uh, uh, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, uh, took away the jungle and the property of it. It's not consolidated, and it's many of those areas that, uh, that, uh, that have been under dispute. Wh what is the government doing? The government has created with the National Planning Department and with the Ministry of Agriculture and with social organizations, including the biggest uh, um, campesino organizations, created a, a, a scenario, mesa, una mesa de tierras, in which we're looking area after area, what to do, how to work, what is the best approach, because the approaches are different region from region. And we hope that in the vic new victims law, a provision for uh, land re uh, resolution of, of conflicts of land uh, in which victims will have, you know, will, will, will be a lot easier, will be implemented. Right now, uh, somebody whose land has been taken away will take years through the judicial process to get its land back. We're going to create a, a, a system that is, that is, that is different. Uh, so we're moving in the right direction, but, but obviously, uh, and I would agree with you, one of the biggest problems that we have has to do with land tenure. Um, Regarding threats, uh, please tell me which of the partner organizations, where are they? We will give them protection, our protection program. Uh, right now, the Mexicans are looking to see if how they can put a protection program like the one Colombia has. Uh, um, I, I would have to remind you that the, the, the protection program the Colombian government started in the year 2002, costing $5 million, I think, and now it's $80 million uh, a year. Uh, we, we protect labor leaders, we protect social leaders, we protect the members of, 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 uh, of, uh, of human rights organizations and members of, of the organizations that feel threatened. Uh, so so um, if, you can, uh, if you can get your people down in Colombia to, to visit me in my office, we will arrange for special security so they can work freely and, 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 and work protected. We're doing it in many, many, many areas. Um, I'm uh, surprised at the extent of, of, of what you put forward in terms of saying, you know, all of them are, are threatened, but um, my job is not to ask uh, if it's right or if it's not, or if it, it's to get your organization to be able to work in Colombia without fear and helping Colombians. So, so that's, my, that's part of my job. That's a job we have been doing since the year 2002 in my office, and, uh, and if you can get in touch with me afterwards, we will work with your, your partner organizations in Colombia to get them all the protection that they're needed. Uh, regarding your questions, what are the, um, the numbers, what are right? I, I would say most of the numbers are sort of the same. I think the numbers that are, have the biggest uh, discrepancy has to do with displacement. Uh, it ha uh, 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 that's the biggest, uh, 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 but to us it's not a number game. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when you look, uh, Colombia now spends every year more than $700 million to attend displacement. Uh, uh, we have probably the most modern legislation where, uh, but still we haven't been able to, to uh, reduce, n not reduce, but to, to see the, we're not even near the, the, the end uh, of the tunnel in terms of, of, of stopping displacement and of, and, and of the whole the process of, of, of resettlement. Uh, in most of the other figures, we, we, we sort of agree. So, so, so I would say that, um, that, uh, that it's not which numbers do you believe but, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, what the problem in, in its essence is. Um, and, and the hardcore uh, uh, human rights organizations, why did not participate? Um, they, you know, there's a problem with interlocution, to be very sincere. And I'll give you an example. For the first, for the first three years of, of our first government, 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2005, early 2005, my office worked to get a national action plan on human rights and international humanitarian plan developed. We worked with state agencies. Uh, we brought experts. Uh, we put forward this, this national action plan uh, to be concerted with uh, social organizations because that's, uh, we've been waiting since 2005 for them uh, to accept, to have that interlocution to get a national action plan that is not a government of Colombia, it's a societal. A, pro a, a program that, uh, 
that, uh, that, that I think it's going to, to uh, that, that we're going to miss, and we're going to miss an opportunity to leave Colombia with a, a very important national action plan that compared to the ones that we compared and the experts say from those countries said it goes way beyond in terms of, of measurement, conditions, capabilities, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and um, sophistication of, of, of the plan. So it's, I would say it's, it has to do with uh, mistrust. It has to do with um, them not participating. They said, you know, this is not something we don't want to be co-opted uh, by the Colombian government. We said, okay, we accept that. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, what's really unfortunate is that in something as important as a national action plan, uh, we haven't been able to get them on board to start discussing it with not only with the Colombian government, but with the rest of Colombian society and the regions so that program, which is very important, is still on hold. One last question, I have to go. One last question. I think he was here first. Those two, okay. we're done. Um, yes, good afternoon, thank you for being here. Thank you also, the Institute of Peace, for putting this event together. Um, my name is Humberto Garces, uh, I'm from Colombia, and I'm the director and co-founder of the Manuel Zapata Olivella for Latino Development Center which is a, a, a nonprofit that promotes visibility, voice, and cultural empowerment among the African descendants from Latin America and the Caribbean here in the DC area. Um, my question is uh, related to the question that Ian Campbell uh, did on Afro-Colombians and also uh, Carlos Quezada for, for, from Global Rights. I think as an Afro-Colombia, I think that uh, the displacement of Afro-Colombian and uh, in the Pacific and Atlantic region, in the in the in the areas where Afro descendants are located, is uh, tightly linked uh, to the drugs and the and the uh, biofuels and development. Um, a lot of the uh, of the politicians who are in jail uh, are strongly related, connected politically with the uh, act with the current government of Colombia, and. Um, of course, the mafia, the, 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 the narco traffics, and the multinational corporations have interest on in those areas. I would like Vice President to, uh, to answer sincerely the question about how the President of Uribe is gonna work to address these issues. Those co how concretely are you going to work to, um, um, because the, the, I don't know how to put this together, but the, the disproportionately uh, increasing of the displacement in the Af in the in the Pacific region has to do with the, with drugs and um, and multinational corporation interest in that particular region. Um, so I would like to see how are the concrete actions that the government is going to take because we is going to come four more years, and I'm sure that we're going to see. <coughs> more Afro-Colombians on the streets of the main cities of the, of the country. So this is my question. And this is also, uh, I'm sorry, just to finish, this is also connected with the free trade agreement and, 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 the, and the development of those corporations. So thank you very much. Your Excellency, sir, ma'am, it's an honor. My name is Claire Siobhan Moran. I'm originally from St. Martin's University. I'm currently enrolled in American University Washington semester in the Peace and Conflict Resolution Seminar. My question is this, and please take it in the spirit of peace building. As Colombia volunteered to be one of the first nations to undergo the UPR, will Colombia assist its neighbor nations as well as foreign nations in assisting and correcting human rights violations and issues? Let me start with, with, with your question. We, as a matter of fact, we are working with the uh, High Commissioner uh, uh, to see how the Colombian experience, which in Geneva was considered uh, uh, in, in a seminar that, that was put forward in an evaluation of the UPR, was considered one of the best UPR processes, uh, uh, to work with the, with the High Commissioner and see what other countries we can assist in terms of how to build that process, how to do follow up, uh, so, so in that sense, uh, the answer the answer is yes, and we have been cooperating. Any government that wants to, 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 to learn from our positive and negative experiences, which we have to, and many of them, uh, uh, after seven and a half years, 
of protecting human rights, where the resistance are, how to improve conditions, what type of programs work, what type of programs don't work. Uh, we're more than open to, to, to help any country that, that asks for, for, for that assistance. And, and regarding uh, your question, uh, as I said before, um, I think uh, the biggest uh, threat to Afro-Colombian communities in the Pacific is without a doubt drug trafficking. Uh, I wouldn't put in the same context uh, what you call biofuels or multinational corporations. There are very little multinational corporations in the Pacific. Uh, the only project of palm oil that was uh, being uh, 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 that was uh, uh, built, uh, uh, taking away land from the Afro-Colombian community, has been returned to the uh, in the uh, Curbarado and Higuamiando area. Uh, they are uh, the the Afro-Colombian community has that land back. Uh, and, uh, and other than that project, uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, know of any other uh, instance in which that has happened. Uh, w if there are, we, we will work as we did in the Higuamiando and Curvarado uh, 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 process uh, to, uh, to return the land to the rightful owners. The problem of uh, communal titles <coughs> that we're giving in the, in the 90s and, and later is that they gave the titles of the land and they did not map who had rightful titles before. So there's been a conflict of ownership that in some cases has been abused by illegal groups, uh, by delinquents to try to uh, uh, increase the amount of land that they had, which is exactly what happened in, in, in Curvarado and Higuamiando. But uh, the policy regarding that is Communal lands by Afro-Colombian communities is theirs to use as their own uh, uh, governmental or their own uh, institutions decide to, to be used. Any external influence, uh, wherever we can find it and wherever we can stop it, we will. Um, in some cases, it has been the FARC that has pushed uh, uh, Afro-Colombian communities to cultivate coca, as we saw it in Nariño, through threats of getting killed. And in other cases has been uh, illegal paramilitaries that took away land from the Afro-Colombian uh, Afro communities in the, in the Atrato uh, uh, Valley, uh, which fortunately, so far, uh, the rightful ownership is back. It's still a matter of time before the latest decision by a judge will give a full possession to, to, to the rightful owners. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Vice President Santos for spending the afternoon with us discussing this important topic, and to Michael Shifter for his willingness to comment, and to all of you for coming. I'd ask you please to remain seated while the Vice President exits the, the building, and then we'll dismiss you all. Thank you again.